Hello and welcome to No Wrong Choices. Along with Larry Shea and Tushar Saxena, I'm Larry Samuels. This is a podcast that's all about the adventures of life. For each episode, we'll talk to somebody who had a a dream, an idea, or a vision, chased after it, and and got there or got pretty darn close. This episode features actor Matt Walton, who is the definition of a working actor as he has been at it for 30 years and has found a way to create a really nice space for himself within the entertainment industry. You know, Larry, as somebody who is or was, I should say, an aspiring actor, I think you can bring a lot of perspective to this conversation. Yes, I think when you're talking about the acting business, you're talking about theater of rejection. I mean, it's all about putting yourself out there to be judged and most of the time not not making the cut you know it is there's a lot of rejection in this business you have to have a lot of ability to pick yourself up dust yourself off and move on and I think what you're going to hear in this interview is someone who as you said is a full working actor and there's no direct path you know you really have to zigzag your way you gotta set yourself up emotionally you have to take classes you have to meet people you have to constantly engage and be out there in the theater community in the movie tv community it's about relationships and I think what you're going to hear is an actor who you know certainly did this during a different time but knew the path that he wanted to take and was persistent enough to pick himself up dust himself off and carry on and have not just some degree of success but a lot of success you know there's very few Brad Pitt's and Al Pacino's in the world but there's a lot of working actors and there's a lot of room for for a career out of this profession and Matt's an impressive guy who was able to do this and you know just listening to him I know you're going to be as impressed as we were about what he was able to accomplish in a, in a tremendous career yeah and Larry as I'll bring out as we enter the interview that his IMDP IMDB page has I think a hundred plus roles on it so this is a guy who has done a ton Tushar what are your thoughts well, full disclosure, I've known Matt for a long time. Matt is a friend of mine. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump on what Larry, on what Shea said as well, is that Matt is a, Matt, Matt's career started out as a starving artist. He understood long, long, you know, long ago that, you know, you've got to put in the hard work and you've got to pay your dues before you get that big break. And that's what he did, right? I mean, he put all the time in small theater. He did small, he did workshops. He did small movies. And then slowly and slowly, he understood how to play the game. And he got to know the right people. He got to know the right casting directors. He got to know the people who you needed to know who would get him work. Look, there's a reason why the, there's a reason why the guy's nickname is Anchorman Matt is because this is what the guy does. If you need an anchor man, trust me, there are so many movies. If you, there are a couple of movies the guy's done over his career. One is a movie called uh, Money Monster, which had George Clooney in it. And who is he in that movie? He is a he's a news anchor in that movie. Another movie that he was in, he was in one of the Purge movies. Who is he in that? A stand-up reporter. If you need a reporter or an anchor man, you call Matt Walton because that's what he was, and that's what he does. And that's how he puts food on his table. And trust me, Matt may not be Brad Pitt or Al Pacino or Robert De Niro, but he is not a he is not starving. That is for sure. Trust me, I've been to his house. He's doing all right. <laughs> there was a great book a bunch of years ago called Hey, It's That Guy, right? Where you see a guy in a movie and, and oh, it's that guy. Like Matt Wallen is that guy. He's that guy. guy. You know, as you said, if you need an anchor man, he's the first call you make. And if you can find that niche in this business and make it work on that kind of level, you have yourself a full blown career. So I love the things that Matt touches upon in this, in this interview. He talks about his training. He talks about his relationships and he talks about the hard work and the breaks along the way and it's super impressive to see what he's done and the one thing that is so surprising about matt's career is that the comparisons from then to now right how you had to really put in the work you had to put in you had to pay your dues and maybe some of that's kind of lost in this day and age where now that everyone has has a cell phone or has the ability to put stuff up on youtube that that notion of putting in the hard work to get that big break Maybe some of that's kind of lost. Well, in the words of Larry Shea, here is that guy. Now joining No Wrong Choices is the very definition of a working actor, because from what I can tell, 
This person never stops working. I looked at uh, IMDb earlier today, 91 credits to his name, covering Broadway, TV, two dozen movies, a video game, more than 100 commercials, and a viral video that is absolutely hysterical called Romney Style. And check this number out, over 65 million views. So clearly this guy uh, has has been around the block. I'm, of course, talking about Matt Walton. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for that stellar introduction. The best part of all of that is I can still go to the mall and no one knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Do people even still go to the mall anymore, though? That's the question. I guess that's probably why. Yeah, is it still relevant? And if you did go to the mall at this point, would you even want to get noticed? It's not, it's not like. Do you remember the movie Soap Dish, where she, where Sally Field's character tried to get noticed at the mall? I don't know if that's the case any longer. Well, it's funny you should mention soap operas because, or soap dish, because there was a time where soap stars were the same, or as uh, gigantic as reality stars, or as uh, as gigantic as the biggest influencers of the day. It's like whoever people uh, shared their living rooms with in the daytime became obsessions, you know. And uh, that's really the secret to uh, television stardom, in particular, is you know they're in your house all the time. You know, I when I used to watch the reruns of Friends, I would get you know get a little drunk and, you know, it would feel like the, 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 the six of these clowns were just down the hall from me in New York City. It was that sort of, you know, uh, relationship with the television. We're not that far out of the cage as a species to be for our brains to be able to tell the difference between people on a screen and people in front of us around the campfire, so to speak. So it's been really interesting. And I started my career uh, in soap operas. Uh, I, I, I hold the distinction of having the most murders in the history of Landview. That Whoa. would be the town from one life to the other. 14 <laughs> murders. Committed by you. Yes, indeed. Um, and so that, but it's funny, at the time, you know, our pay cut, our paychecks were getting cut every year when, uh, in the days of Soap Dish, these were seven-figure contracts. You know what big I mean? Money, so big money, big money contracts. crazy how times change, and that's really, we'll get more to that uh, as the interview goes on, but that's really the story of why I'm even working today is is just adapting to change. Matt, let me ask you, you know, I, I, I guess I've never really asked you this this question about how and why you got into the field that you have. So I'll ask you a bit about your backstory somewhat. Then, you know, have you always wanted to be an actor? What attracted you to it? Why did you why did you decide that this is what you want to do for the rest of your life? Well, the first thing I ever remember knowing I wanted to do was be the next George Lucas. I saw Star Wars in the theater when I was four years old, and I didn't want to be Han Solo. I didn't want to be Harrison Ford, even. I wanted to be the bringer of that world. I wanted to be George Lucas. So I was like, I'm going to be the next George Lucas or Steven Spielberg. Well, didn't really have access to filmmaking equipment, um, but I, you know, I had access to a store called Shelby's up the highway. I grew up in very rural New Jersey, right. what I like to call West Virginia, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, we had to ride our bikes everywhere. We're, you know, very blue collar, small uh, income town. Uh, so we would ride our bikes to Shelby's and I could get G.I. Joe toys, you know, or Star Wars figures or Masters of the Universe figures. So I, I guess I always played with my toys pretty intensely. I still have all those toys today. If there's any listeners out there looking to buy a gigantic storage <laughs> unit full of 80s toys, 70s and 80s toys, I am looking for a buyer. Uh, did you have uh, the Millennium Falcon? Of course I have the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> if it, love is those. it mint in box? If it's mint in box, <laughs> hold on to it. I have nothing mint in box. That's the only unfortunate re- thing about it. A um, couple of the latter-day toys when, when that first started to become a thing. Um but, I, you know, I was I was raised Catholic, so we would do little shows at the church. And, you know, I was always uh, in the community theater as part of the church basement. You know, we put on like Annie and the Wizard of Oz and stuff. So I was always kind of a natural at that uh, just by chance. You know, my mother was very gregarious and her, my grandfather played the organ. You know, he's a good Irish boy. They were all military brats. But, uh, you know, my brother and I were the first generation on our family to not... Uh, have to go to war you know i was born in 73 at the end of vietnam when the draft the draft was abolished so you know what were we going to do everybody in my family went into the service what were we going to do my my brother became a politician and an engineer and i became uh, an artist type you know um there's lots more to this story but the, the the short version is uh in high school i was both a visual artist and a performing artist um 
and I was trying to figure out the, the quickest way for me to use those skills to get the hell out of the town I grew up in. <laughs> My home life is very uh, unsatisfactory, uh, to say the least. So uh, I, I, it was either going to be I was going to be a comic book artist or an actor. Those were the two things that I like. Those were the two career paths I could have chosen. And I thought to my infinite wisdom in, uh, you know, the fall of, or the spring of 1991, comic books have no future. There's <laughs> yeah. we're the last generation what? that's going to give a shit <laughs> about superheroes. So I'll just go be an actor. Should be easy. Shouldn't be, you know, as much. Well, boy, was I wrong about both of those things. But, uh, I, you know, the, nothing worse than uh, seeing, uh, well, anyway, the, we can yeah, get, let's get into that. Comic yeah. books have taken yeah. over entertainment, yeah. but uh, <laughs> but anyway, so that's what started me out. It's just I just I just I was good good at it, you know. It's just something that was came easy to me, so I didn't have to try very hard. You know how like natural athletes just they just play sports and they just they just excel at sports. No rhyme or reason to it. Um, but I was you know stupid enough or wise enough to pursue it as an actual career, which at the time it was not a viable profession. Today. I, I still wouldn't call it a viable profession, but it's not as crazy an idea for a parent to let their kid go to a theater school. Um, but anyway, I put myself through school, so I, my parents never even had a say about it. Uh, I got a scholarship to the Boston Conservatory because at the time, no men were really getting into the theater. It was late 80s, early 90s. Um, wasn't a lot of competition for a really good theater program. And uh, I chose that school because they would let you perform your freshman year, whereas like the better, well, the more reputable schools like NYU and Yale or whatever, you would have to uh, sit out your freshman year and just learn. And I was like, I'm not sure there's going to be a sophomore year, here, so <laughs> I'm going to go to the place. I'm going to go to the place that I can perform right away because if this doesn't work out, at least I got some time in. And uh, they ended up giving me a, a, a full academic scholarship. So, That's amazing. Wow. I was in Boston. Yeah, I was in Boston for six years. Didn't really want to leave. Uh, got to audition for uh, school school ties with Affleck and Dane sure. and Brendan Fraser. Oh, that's a great oh, sure, movie. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that was my sort of first big movie audition when I was like, you know, 19. Got my, uh, did my first professional gig at 19. What was that? Um, it was uh, uh, at Chiswick Park Playhouse, uh, the role of the bellhop in Lend Me a Tenor. Wow. The Craig Ludwig farce, which was fresh from... Uh, the Broadway stage going out into the regions. And uh, yeah, so that was cool. And it's where actually where I met the guy who represented me when I moved to New York for the first couple of years. He'd seen me in the show and he said, you really want to probably leave school now and just come down to New York. There's a shortage of young kids and, you know, we could really use you. I'm like, ah, I don't really have a place to stay. I don't really couldn't do that. Uh, I'll finish out school. He's like, you really shouldn't. You should probably come down. Let me rep you, you know, like you figure out a way and. Sure enough, years later, I go on to give that advice to kids who are really in, into it. I'm like, you probably shouldn't go to school right now. I should probably go right to New York or L.A. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, you know, I just uh, I got into it. I decided I was going to try really, really, really hard to, to make it. Failure was not an option, uh, whereas a lot of people I went to school with, and a lot of people I met when I first entered the industry, it seemed failure was a, a very good option for them. Uh, and again, circling back to the theme of the day, it was tenacity. I just did not give up. Larry Shea here. Good to talk to you, Matt. I, I want to get back to that part of it because I don't, the formal training thing, going to school, you said six years you spent at university studying? No, I was only – well, I was, I was in Boston for four. It was a four-year program. It probably should have been a two-year program. And then I stayed there another year and change, right. performing, working in the Boston market such that it was at the time, um, not really having the means to go down to New York. But, uh, I mean, there is a crazy kind of Hollywood connection to all of this. I, I, my first year out of school, I had done a show – with Chris Evans's brother, the guy who played Captain America, his younger brother, they were both, uh, you know, like eleven and twelve at the time, and I befriended their family at a young age. And it's, in fact, it was Chris Evans who I advised to not go to a conservatory <laughs> or theater school, just come down to New York, hang out, you know, and uh, you can stay with me, and I'll, I'll look over you. And you know, he interned at a casting office up the road, and boom, he got a TV show within a couple of days. I mean, it was just a different time where. Um, Hollywood was grabbing young people. Um, it was the uh, late '90s at this point, and it was very clear that uh, the, the advice that that crazy manager gave me uh, 
a couple of years earlier was true. Let's let's talk about that. Everybody, was let's talk about the university. manager. How did you get the like? Because you yeah. you know it's. We always talk about relationships are part of how you win in this game, right? Whatever you're trying to do, it's about relationships. That's usually how you hear about a job or, you know, whatever the case may be. How did you, how did this manager find you or you find this manager? What was the instance that, because that sounds like it was a bridge to get you from point A to point B and it was a big one. Well, you talk about relationships. I'll, I'll try to tell this story as quickly as possible. Um, when I was doing performing arts in high school, because I was kind of raising myself, my brother and I, and uh, you know, my father was, was, was busy with his second wife. My mother passed away when I was young. We were mm. just kind of raising ourselves, as a lot of kids in the 80s did. Right. Uh, you know, working to feed and clothe ourselves made me very resourceful. And so um, I befriended a lot of people in the theater program at my high school. One of them said, hey, you got to come to me, come with me to this performing arts night school they need a guy to play this part and i went to this performing arts night school with this girl who was a couple years older than me and um the owner of the school this is like halfway between where i grew up and new york city like in morristown new jersey which is about <laughs> sure 20 miles outside new york i guess and i lived about 50 miles outside new york um so i went to this night school and again it was a time where just no guys were no kids were going into performing arts so she's like hey you can come take every class we teach here but you have to do every show we do which was the same deal at the conservatory hey we'll give you an academic scholarship but you have to audition for every show we do so you talk about gladwell's 10,000 hours theory i got my 10,000 right. hours before i even got to college you know wow. for real um so i was just going to this performing arts night school every night uh, and as a result, I, you know, a, a girl from there was able to take me up to Boston for the Boston audition. Uh, and, uh, I got in and w when I was in the, cons uh, oh, oh, while I was at the performing arts night school in Morristown, why I brought this up is, uh, I was, the this home situation was so bad. I had to get out. I ended up moving in with this gay couple and I was this guy, I was like a hillbilly kid, you know, with a mullet and, you know, bad skin. And I moved in with this gay couple. I didn't even know they were gay at the time. I didn't even really know what that even was. I didn't even care. I was just trying to survive, right? Well, they gave me the queer eye for the straight guy makeover. <laughs> I get to the conservatory. <laughs> I'm looking. Cause suddenly I go from zero to freaking, you know, the, the, the guy. Hero, yeah. You know. <laughs> Probably and, one of the uh, best things that's ever happened to you. Oh, and so this teacher took a shine. This, this gay male teacher took a shine to me and got me a chance to audition for this professional production of this farce. And uh, so funny, now that I think about it, the first show I ever did in high school was a farce, and the first professional show I ever did was a farce, too. I guess it's uh, where the comedy, the comedy and I have always been very close. Yeah, George Carlin is like a uh, philosopher king to me. But anyway, um, skipping ahead, yeah, so it was a connection at the at high school, and then the connection at the Performing Arts Night School, and then the connection at the college, and then the connection... At the professional show, another actress in the show was represented by this manager. This manager came to see her up in Boston, see her, his client in the show. And he's like, you're good, kid. You're great. You should move to New York and, you know, I'll represent you. And like I said, I, I, I balked and waited a couple of years. Well, he was the only guy I knew at the time when I did move to New York. Uh, my roommate, uh, a friend of mine was a year younger than me. I had worked in, in Boston for about a year. Uh, he... He graduated. Hey, Matt, I need a roommate down in New York. I'm moving to New York. You have to come with me. It's time for you to come to New York. I'm like, I don't know, Andy. I'm doing fine up in Boston. It's fine. No, no, you're coming with me. So I went to uh, Chris Evans's mom, as a matter of fact, mom and dad. And we would sit around the family table all the time and talk. And I'm like, yeah, this friend of mine wants me to move to New York. And they like gave me a thousand bucks to move to New York. Like just, Chris Evans' parents of, did. Yeah. Out of the goodness of their heart. Just like you should, you do need to go to New York. So, you know. Again, like just the people you meet, the people you're friends with. And the only way I ever became friends with any of these people is being myself. Yeah. You know, the, uh, when I was the most myself is when these relationships, uh, you know, solidified, cemented for sure. Because as I'm, I never even realized that till I'm having this conversation with you guys. It's like, so what was all those points? I was the goofiest version of myself, the silliest, craziest, most dramatic version of myself. And, we were all just birds of a feather. Everybody yeah. in that conversation I mentioned was like, yeah, I dig that. I like the cut of your jib. You know what I mean? Let's hang out. We're friends. Now, you know? <laughs> yeah. And here, I'll help you out. And I help them out. Everybody helps each other out. And yes, relationships are, are primary in acting and in life. No, for sure. So, so what was it like? Like, I think back to that time. Um, one of my first roommates in New York, 
back in 1994 was an actor who coincidentally, I think she went to Boston University. And, nice. Um, she used to, like, I would come home from work. There would be literally 17 or 18 voicemails on the machine. One mm-hmm. of them would be for me. 17 would be for her. And mm-hmm. she auditioned all the time. And mm-hmm. in addition to that, she bartended over here. She bartended over there. She would have rice for dinner upon occasion. <laughs> like she was really struggling trying to keep it together. So, you know, you come and come to New York with that thousand dollars. What is life like for you as you're trying to break through? And how long did it take for things to change? Well, you have to understand that thousand dollars got me an apartment, right? Got me the down, the, the, the first down payment and the first month's rent of half an apartment with my other friend. Uh, so that thousand dollars was gone in, in in a day, uh, and from there I, I literally walked off the bus, walked into Times Square, and from a, another connection, a guy I was doing a play with in Boston. It was a version of Tony and Tina's wedding up in Boston. He's like, "Hey, I work at the All Star Cafe in Times Square. Come on in, I'll, I'll get you a job there." I'm like, "Great, Times Square sounds good. Waiting tables in Times Square, right off the bus. Well, this was this crazy, gigantic stadium theme restaurant." Um, I mean, the first year, my feet were just demolished being, you know, going from living, a, you know, kind of a chill art, artistic college life to uh, to, to just pa- literally pounding the pavement. And of course, as you mentioned, New York was analog at the time. So my day was spent, you know, how often people check their texts yeah, during yep. the day. That's me at a payphone with a quarter. Wow. <laughs> and if my, vo- if, if my answering service uh, rang... Before it picked up, that meant there were no new messages. You could hang up and get your quarterback. <laughs> right. Remember that little, that little like advancement in technology? You know, it was kind of right before call waiting. I, I, uh, apparently, my life wasn't that interesting. I don't remember that. Oh, my God. And then, and then, you know, then pagers came sure. out, where the pagers became sort of affordable. So I had one of those. But, yeah, the voicemail, the, the old voicemail. And, of course... The old headshot on a piece of paper, the yep. old uh, the demo reel on a VHS tape. I mean, those were to get one of those edited was like a thousand dollar investment. You know, now you just get it. You can edit stuff. You can edit films on your phone. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, late nineties New York. But but it was also you have to understand it was also like the last great era of New York City. It was you know Sopranos and Sex in the City and. Uh, you know, American Psycho, and it was that New York. You know, it was uh, everyone was making money because the dot com thing was just, you know, vapor. Yep. Everyone was trading vapor and ideas, and everyone was just putting money. Everybody had money. The bus boys at the bar as it had made as much money a night as the bartenders. Everyone was spending it. Everyone was partying with it, and every, the, you know, it was New York was safe. It was bumping. I, it was just a great, great time to be in New York. You literally. Walk up the road and muster yourself up a job. You know, whether it was, I'll never forget, uh, my waiting tables is the worst service job in the world, period. I'd rather be a garbage man. The garbage men get more respect than waiters. But bartending happens to be the best service job in the world because you're the legal drug dealer. It's the only service industry where you can tell your customers no. In fact, by law, you have to tell your customers no if you've served them well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's too well. It's great. Uh, so, but becoming, you know, the old saying was, I'm going to become an actor because bartending jobs are too hard to find. Well, (laughs) I went from, my path was waiter to bartender and then bartending became a a grind because it was the lounge era and like the doormen were getting the big money. You know what I mean? Bartenders would have to work, but the doormen could just chill, meet everybody and make, you know, killer cash. So... I was in an acting class and I talked to a friend and I'm like, hey, what do you do for work? He goes, hey, I work for Randy Gerber at the at one of the uh, whiskey bars. And, you know, and as a matter of fact, my guy who I work with on weekends is he just got his first TV show. He's leaving. There's a there's an opening for you. I can get you in if you show up tonight. And I show up tonight and who is leaving? He's like in his jacket, ready to go. It's Bradley Cooper. Wow. Wow. Bradley Cooper, he was standing, he's like, he was there for 10 minutes. He goes, so basically, you know, he's supposed to train me. And 10 minutes of standing there looking cool was about all the training it took. He's like, hey, man, you good? I'm like, yeah, dude, I, I think I got this. He's like, okay, <laughs> go, I'm off the <laughs> And I didn't see that mug until Wedding Crashers. It was amazing. And I didn't really put it together. Like, it, I had to backtrack over the years. And then I looked through an old, uh, you know, uh, no, and it was. It was totally him. It was so crazy. So, um, yeah, but it was, it was a good time to 
try to make it in New York is one of the sort of last times where a guy like me could, I think. I think it's, got, it's gotten too expensive now. When I was there, the artists could still intermingle with the super wealthy, and they all, we all partied together. Now I feel like, you know, uh, it's just a whole different vibe. But, but uh, from last time I was in New York, um, it seems like the, the COVID kids are, are ready to, to make a big splash again because you know, they got two years if they were in high school or college ripped, right. ripped, ripped away from them. Yep. They're in the big cities now making stuff happen. It's, it's pretty cool. So I guess I, I guess maybe that's a good way to kind of maybe transition a bit and ask about the hustle, right? So for you, the hustle was, you know, obviously working in restaurants, working in waiting tables, and then eventually bartending, and then obviously, you know, working the door as well before you got the break. So uh, had, uh, are you happy now? Or, or let me, I'm not happy. Let me ask you this differently. Do you think that the hustle has changed to a point where the industry has forced the hustle to change? Well, I mean – with the internet and social media, I mean, it's just a tidal wave of change in every way, shape, or form, for for better and worse. You know, everything great has its death right in it, but it still has it's still half great, right? So, what has the internet brought t- uh, brought television, for example? Yeah, it might have killed, you know, the the three camera sitcom, but it gave us streaming network series, man. Like, we get these these thirteen hour long films now. Yeah. You know, where we get to fall in love with these people without commercials and in a cinematic, like mind blowing experience. Uh, so, so, you know, for scripted television, it has certainly shifted. But, um, what makes me most unhappy is this isn't the Hollywood that I went after. Okay. It was before Richard Hatch won the first survivor and you know it became clear that okay now we're going to root for the villain from here on out uh and, and that villain becoming the billionaire and the, the you know the, the the you know the sex tape turned mogul and you know just just how this, the bad behavior became so glorified it really changed the culture and it gave permission to you know bad taste and, and and lower quality stuff, you know what I mean? Nothing we could do about it. You know, it was, entertainment has always been for sale. And, you know, networks realized, oh, they like the guy from the real world who, you know, blows snot rockets on people. Okay, well, we'll do more snot rocket characters, you know. You know, they just, they, they, they go where the money is. I mean, it's show business. It ain't show friends, yep. you know what I mean? But, um it, that's been the most disappointing part. However, uh, again, circling back to the theme, it was always about adaptation. So when, uh, well, ba- where I was most successful was in the commercial market, right? That's a, that was been a New York based market for most of, uh, you know, Madison. Well, it's a Madison Avenue address, New York City, uh, and Madison Avenue is synonymous with advertising, right? So. Being a New York actor in the 90s when there was still cable commercials and still radio and still um, uh, TV, you know, with commercials before streaming, there was tons and tons and tons of work. And a bunch of us, you know, above average, I'll just say above average actors, not not the best actors in the world, not the not the movie stars, but like a bunch of working actors could make a very nice living uh, just doing bunch of commercials a year, a bunch of voiceovers a year, and an occasional uh, studio film that's shot in New York or a TV series that's shot. And of course, all the laws in order, you know, and then the soaps, you know, there was still, you still had options. You could still build a career. Best thing about soap operas was you could sort of test your results in real time. It was very highfalutin kind of acting and you could really make sure that you weren't, you were being truthful in the most absurd circumstances <laughs> because you, you only got two takes and you could see the episode three days later. Whereas you do a law and order, it's like three weeks later and you, you know, you got 48 takes. You don't know what camera got what, you know, it's very hard to sort of track. Oh, and by the way, you're not the star. So you don't really get to see yourself act much. Um, on the soaps, it was a great training ground. You know, I guess I would equate that to YouTube today, you know, or, or TikTok actually. Um, you know, that's where a performer can hone their skills is uh, through their phone rather than on sort of an ancillary form of entertainment. Uh, 
what was what, what was the whole point of this? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. It was about the hustle, but I think I think we kind of I think we got into like a, a good. Well, yeah, there were options back in the day. There were options for for actors. You know, like I said, soap operas. Uh, you could go to Hollywood. You could be in New York. You could even if you're Canadian. You know, we we lost a ton of work to Canada for a while, but. Uh, because the media keeps changing, right? The industry keeps changing. So if you are able to, by hook or by crook, change somehow with that media and with the cultural changes, you can you can stay in the game. You know, a lot of people are like, well, they, who moves my cheese? I, I don't have any cheese. You know, well, you got to go where the cheese is. You know, there's more cheese. It's just somebody moved it, you know. That's that book. I remember that was like one of the last things my father gave me a photo, a Xeroxed copy of Who Moved My Cheese. That sounds that was about my college right. graduation. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the hustle, you, 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 and, and, and in show business, if you don't have the propensity to, for the hustle, uh, you can't you can't hang. You know what I mean? Unless you're blessed, but it's it's like any entrepreneurial job. You're always looking for your next job. Now, it's a little different than an influencer who is always looking for a way to show off um, because you can just you can always tape yourself just being an idiot, you know, whereas with as an actor or a director or, you know, any of the uh, other crafts in, in, in film and television and theater, you're chasing the work. You know what I mean? You're not. Yeah. And it's really hard. Everyone's like, you got to make your own work, which you can do. But, you know, I can't make my own Avengers movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> try as I might. I, no, no matter I, how hard you try. I ain't going to get the dollars. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, so what was the what was the first really big break into what was it either? Was it commercial work for you? Was it soap yeah. work? Which was it? First, the, the first the first job I ever got that let, let me quit bartending was an M&M's commercial. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember it, but it was sort of like the giant M&M's were storming New York. A la oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And we're talking, boy, uh, 98, 99, That's probably a little bit earlier than that, but yeah, okay. 2000. And I was one of the overdubbed, you know, they had Asian actors running from the giant M&M and pointing at it like they do in the Godzilla movies and then, you know, mouthing something different. A commercial you couldn't even make today. I was thinking not, exactly yeah, 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 that. Oddly. There's no way on earth. <laughs> so much stuff that we made back in the day cannot even be made today. Um, that's why I say it was like the last great era of New York was before. I don't yeah, I, you know. I, people say it wasn't great for everybody. I don't know. It seemed like everybody was thriving in the late 90s in New York, no matter, no matter who you were. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, or at least thriving compared to the way you were in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, Let's it just was put it that way. It was definitely fun. Uh, but yeah, so it's a stupid M&M's commercial. It was a stupid M&M's commercial. And I made a bunch of money on it. Like, you know, 40 grand or something wow. in, in, a, in like six months. And I was like, wow, that's it's better than bartending. And I don't have to, you know, I don't have to stay up till four in the morning anymore. So I kept doing that and, you know, building that up to about a six-figure income over several years. Uh, which, you know, it sounds like a lot of money. And it certainly is. But in New York City, with a team of, of agents and managers... Uh, does not go very far. That's the big misconception with actors. Yeah, they make twenty million dollars, but they take home seven. Yeah, you got to yep. pay everybody else, right? Manager everybody. and agent, and yeah, publicist, yeah. IRS. Yeah. Um, let's talk about getting the job because I mean I don't want to gloss over. I think one of the most intimidating things for people out there who want to be an actor or what have you is is the audition process, right? It's intimidating. It's a recipe for failure. You know, a lot of actors talk about having to go on ninety nine. You know, 100 auditions to get one job, basically. So were you confident in your auditions? Do you believe in dressing for the part so that they don't have to think as hard about casting you in a particular role? Talk about the actual auditioning process. You must have some stories. So uh, when I first started out, auditions were always when I had to work, almost by uh, by definition. And, and there was a, a time when it was people were just starting to make their own stuff. Like the technology was just becoming affordable enough that people could make their own things. But these people usually had nine to five jobs. So they'd be holding the auditions at night when all the actors were waiting tables, you know, or, um, or whatever, or it would just work out. You're like, Hey, we've got this, you can do this industrial, you know, you can, or, or, you know, I was like, Oh man, I have to cater that day. Of course. That's when the audition came in. So it wasn't until, uh, I got into voiceovers where I was, where I'm even able to give you any sort of analytics about audition data, you know, uh, it was just such a struggle to 
if, you know, not coming from money. That's why Howard Stern even says show business and acting in particular is a really good career path for rich kids because they are, they, they, they come with the confidence baked in the confidence of, you know, not really having to worry about stuff, not needing the job because if it doesn't work out, they'll just do something else. Um, and I'm not shitting on rich people. It's just, it's just, it just happens to be true. Most yep. of the guys I know who hit it young came from very well-off families, just how it is. Um, and they didn't go to college. That's another part. Or they That's, did, and they got it right out of college, or they made connections in college that got them their jobs. We talked uh, to a, a talent agent in one of our previous episodes who oh, yeah? talked about you know how he was able to break through, and he started pushing the mail cart at uh, William Morris, You know that, uh, that, that legendary right of passage and his comment was i never would have been able to do that if i didn't come from a good set of circumstances so you're totally right yeah i mean that, that's interesting that he, most people can't really see that they don't have their my it's like in a million passes. years i never could have done that if i didn't have that net behind me oh well god bless him for knowing known reality because most you know most guys are like they, they, they just don't know anything else so they assume it's like when Mitt Romney said just ask your parents for a $20,000 loan <laughs> right he thought that's normal <laughs> it's like yeah just do that you know uh, which reminds me my grandmother used to say why don't you just get a soap opera why don't you just do a soap opera like, <laughs> what does that mean try it I'm, like, just remember, I'm setting up and then the I'm gonna get a stars. sandwich yeah. the, old, the old system was you'd get the backstage magazine the backstage like newspaper you'd get a z- zillion envelopes from some staples the big 8x12 envelopes and you'd stick your 8x10 headshot in there with a cover letter that you typed up and printed out on your word processing machine you know and then you would uh, send off you know 30 of those a week 50 of those a week uh, you get some calls on your answering service and you go in and you audition and, you know, with, with 30 other people and maybe you get the thing and maybe the thing does something. Or maybe you do enough things where you can put a couple of those things together on a VHS tape, send that off to an agent. You know, at that time, you know, were, were, were you the type? It was very crowded field at the time and the, the media was changing. So there are a lot of actors people didn't know what to do with. You just kept having to hit that, hit that, hit that. And it's easier to do when you're young and full of, you know, full of motivation. It's much harder to do uh, when you're over 40, right? So the, you, every actor's sort of got their time limit baked in. And whether, you know, depending on how far you make it or not, uh, very few people hang tough past 40, you know. Um, and so once you get sort of over that hill and you've worked enough and all the casting directors know you from all the years you pounded that pavement, you sent them the cover letters and the thank you notes and the, hey, I'm doing this play over here. Please come see it. And even if they never see it, they remember when your headshot comes through their mailbox. Oh, yeah, he was doing that play. I would have liked to have seen that. Heard it was good. I'll bring him in for this, you know. And then you do well. I mean, the, the way I sort of approached the downtime was studied. You know, I read every single book on the subject. I went to acting classes way past when I really should have, you know, uh, you can get overtrained in things. Um, you know, I was just trying to keep in the game and meeting people and hoping that one day they would become a casting agent or a, a director of a film. You know, you just keep kind of keep your contacts all together. Now with social media, it's a lot easier to do that. There's a lot of top of mind stuff, but it's the same marketing that goes. In fact, you're keeping, you're trying to keep your name top of mind, however that has to be. And it's, you know, it is, it was in New York anyway, and I'm sure in LA this is the same way. Just exhausting. You know, you do these plays and in the city and nobody would come, but you'd have to do them because you'd have to make the contacts and you have to send out the letters and tell people you were doing them. So after years of doing that, probably two straight decades of doing that, I was able to establish myself. Now people in New York anyway, and most of the L.A. cast directors, they know who I am. They know what I've done. They, they know, like, oh, if we, if we need that guy, we can call Matt Walton. You know, I, 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 for years I struggled to get a really good agent. And then by a fluke of, you know, strange luck, a miscommunication, a, mis- a typo on the SAG website, uh, I ended up signing with Don Buckwald and Associate, Howard Stern's agent. And uh, they have an L.A. office and a New York office. And I've been with them for 15 years at this point, all, signed all across the board. Uh, and I'm never leaving. And I don't think they're going to drop me. You know what I mean? So I, I'm very, very fortunate to be in one of those situations. Most actors would just dream of, you know, you're never safe. You know, you never feel safe. 
But because and the other the other the other thing too, man, is you got to diversify. You can't yeah. just do in this business. You can't just do voiceovers. You got to also do on camera commercials. You got to also do movies. You got to also, you know, uh, help people with their auditions when they need it. Or 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 you meet a young kid who wants to get an acting. You got to go out with him and his parents and sit him down and give him the the, the business. You know, give him the details. You got to keep you know the the good. Uh, sort of energy flowing you got to give and take and give and take and, and that's uh you got to be very selfless and selfish both of those sort of things on hyperdrive all the time so it's exhausting it's exhausting and, and is there a payoff i don't know you know most of my famous friends aren't very happy <laughs> you know um there's, there's, there's are you there's, happy like say, yeah dude like i'm at a point where like i said i I can pay my bills. Like if I see a shirt on the internet that I want to buy, I can afford to buy the shirt. You know, I, I've got a daughter about to go to college. You know, I can send her off to school. Got her a car because she got on the honor roll. Like I'm not, lo- I'm not, I'm never like rolling in it. But I, you know, worked hard enough and put in enough of the effort, and now I'm able to not coast, but work. You know, I have options now. Um, and again, now that. Technology has sort of become well. Every look, everybody's got a studio in their pocket, right? Everybody's got a broadcast studio in their pocket, and we've seen how far-reaching those broadcasts can be. Any moron can film themselves yelling on the phone, and we will. <laughs> the whole world will see it if it's crazy enough or funny enough, right? That's that's an amazing amount of power you give to the general population. Uh, great power comes great responsibility. Not everyone is very responsible with that power. I and appreciate it waters you the quoting whole thing Spider-Man. Down. It waters all things down, but it also makes the excellence rise. I mean, you know, you're seeing you're seeing work out there uh, in every field of entertainment that is just exquisite, barring, of course, reality TV, which could never be exquisite by definition because it is trash by definition. <laughs> but every, look, we I eat French fries. We all want trash sometimes. So Matt, um, you know, I, I mentioned off the top, you know, ninety-one yeah. different things that you've done. You know, when you look back across your career, you know, what are some of those things that that you're oh, most easy. proud of? Um, honestly, uh, my my getting on a soap opera is one of them. Uh, you'd be surprised how hard that acting is, and you'd be surprised how amazingly talented the actors on those soaps are. When when when, so, when people make fun of soap opera acting, that's in that's intentional. That used to keep people hanging by their you know by their fingernails for the next day. That sort of um, I, I say highfalutin acting, but it's um, you know people would call it hammy acting or over the top. No, no, it that's really hard to do because your body you want to tell the truth, you know, and if and if anyone's too over the top. It's just a really fine line. So being able to sort of accomplish that and reach that, enter that world, even though it was mostly, you know, crapped upon by by the industry. Uh, I'm very proud of, of the work and the people that I used to work with there. Um, from there, getting a Coen Brothers movie was something I never dreamed would happen to me. Um, a burn After Reading. Uh, Ellen Lewis, I believe, was the casting director, and she cast me in several great things. Thank God. Um and it was one of those things I had to play a morning show host, which is sort of my wheelhouse. You know, I'm kind of a guy, smiley, kind of looking guy. And, uh, you know, I was I did my thing for, for Ellen Lewis, and she's very stone-faced. And she's like, okay. And next thing you know, my manager calls and says, uh, you got a call back for the Coens. You're going to read with the Coens. I'm like, what? Man, oh, man. You know, I, my favorite movies ever were Coen Brothers movies at this point. Yeah, I'm saying, these are gods to me, right? So I'm in there, and <laughs> I'm doing my audition, and they start cracking up. And I... I literally looked behind me to see if there was someone behind me they were laughing at, you know, and I finished the, I did it, my next line. They were cracking up again. They're just like, you know, I could just tell I, they had found their guy You know, it was a small part, but who cares? It was a Coen brothers movie. Uh, and then it, what, funny enough, you know, I, they, you know, they said something at the end of the audition, like, Oh man, that was so perfect. You don't have to worry about anything. We'll see on set. Something along those lines. I couldn't quite tell because my body sort of went numb at the time. <laughs> and then, Went wow. on set and we had such a good time on set. They ended up writing me a second little scene and to come oh, back wow. and shoot the next Monday. Totally. I mean, one of those dream come true. Um, and then uh, speaking of those, I was cast in a same casting director 
um, in Scorsese's Irishman, The Irishman. So, and my scene was with Al Pacino. Amazing. So I was able to act with Pacino under the direction of Martin Scorsese for one glorious afternoon. And I made my mark. Wow. Boys, I made my mark. Here's what happened. First, I meet Al in the morning and he stumbles and falls out of his trailer. He's so old and, and sort of bent over at this point. And he literally fell out of his trailer. So that was weird. And then um, I get to set and, you know, it looks, they just, they, I was playing, again, a, a host of um, Meet the Press. And I was interviewing uh, Pacino's character, who is, uh, of course, the Jimmy famous Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa, yeah. So, you know, I did my research on that particular interview and I looked through all the questions and I, you know, looked at the script and how it was different because I knew that Scorsese liked a, a researched actor. And I get there and I sit down, I'm ready to give give him the business. And Pacino is getting his lines read to him through an earwig by his assistant. Because it's a massive movie. He's been on it for a year and a half at this point. He can't memorize all these lines. And the scripts keep changing. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, oh, man. You know, he jumps his, his line because he doesn't hear me. He's listening to, the, to his assistant. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to get to act with this guy. I'm just going to get to you know, read this thing in this shot, and he's going to say it over here. <laughs> so I'm like, Matty, you got one shot, bro. So Marty comes down. I'm like, okay, that was good. That was good. Okay, uh, let's just do it again. You want to do it again? Let's do it again. <laughs> Off he goes. And he's like wearing little white gloves. I, don't, I never figured that out. And uh, uh, off he goes. And, you know. Pacino gives me his line and I return with an entirely different line or, or maybe I, my one was the first line. I don't remember. Anyway, I could like entirely different line. Um, so, but, but within the character, within, within the interview, like he obviously interviewed, uh, researched the interview as well, because it didn't throw him for a second. If anything, he's like, Oh, I don't know even what word I dropped, you know, uh, qualified. We'll say, Oh, qualified, qualified. You want to know? I'm, let me tell you who's qualified. And off he goes on this whole rant about being qualified. Or some, whatever it was. I don't even remember the words. I just couldn't believe I was fucking acting with Al Pacino. Literally acting in the moment with Al Pacino. And uh, uh, Scorsese comes down. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that was, that was good. We love it. We're good. Let's keep that. Let's keep doing that. Do that, do that again. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. And off he went again. And then I look over to the right. And Pacino gives me a wink and a thumbs up. Like, good job, kid. I was like, oh, my God. Oh my and I was God. hardly a wow. kid, man. I'm in my 40s, well into my 40s <laughs> at this stage. Didn't matter. But I guess a kid to hear. <laughs> That's right. You're and then uh, the last, the last thing, you know, I was directed by Jodie Foster. That was incredible. And then uh, I just worked with Ewan McGregor, which was awesome. Um, on what? I did Halston. Uh, I did a day with him on Halston, and he was just the most splendid gent you'd ever you'd ever want to work with. Was that Very the Netflix? Was that the Netflix? Movie? Yeah. 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 Okay. So biggest yeah. boneheaded mistake you ever made on, on set or something you just regretted, a decision that just, oh, man, what was I thinking when I took this part or did this this thing? Anything like that jump out? Uh, yeah, there's a lot. Of <laughs> I remember one time. A lot. Oh, man. I remember one time I took some call. I was getting I was called back to a. Uh, to be in a play with uh, a John Guar play. And John Guar was this playwright, late 60s playwright. He wrote House of Blue Leaves and uh, Six Degrees of Separation. And I'd seen his, I was a big fan of his work. And he was writing, he was producing one of his last plays in New York. And I blew the casting director away for this character. And I was going to go read with Guar, you know. And I was like, I can't believe this. And it looked like the part was going to be mine. So I, uh, but I wasn't feeling well. And I took, I was like, I shouldn't, I should just go in with a cold. And I ended up taking like uh, some kind of daytime cold medicine. And I had the jitters. <laughs> I had like the jitters and it was all like sort of just not, and you could just see the disappointment in their faces, like drip as I was trying to give this performance and trying, it looked like I was on drugs. I mean, that's really what they must have thought was that I was on like some kind of speed or something because I was all jittery and just, you know, my mouth didn't work. I was just. It's one of those things, you know, I was just too nervous in front of one of my idols and, you know, I crapped the bed. Um, Your instrument failed that, you. Now, the, the biggest, the big, the biggest regret uh, was not my fault, but it's a good story. Um, it was my first big screen test in Hollywood and it was for a pilot called In Case of Emergency. I think Ben Silverman ended up doing it with, uh, I know, um, uh, Ar John Arquette, who's the Arquette brother? David, 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 David Arquette. Arquette. David Arquette. Yep. Uh, and it was directed by John Favreau. 
before Marvel, but way after uh, Swingers, you know. Okay. Uh, so it was my first screen test. Like, but but the writer clearly wanted me. Favreau wanted Arquette from the start, so I knew going in it was going to be hard. And Favreau was known to be a hard ass at the time. He, was, he had back pain. It was just he was just very very sour to be around. I was told. So uh, they booked me a flight and they're like, what we're going to do is you're going to go right from the airport to Favreau's house in Malibu and you're going to work on the scene with Favreau and the writer all day. And then you'll go to your screen test tomorrow because basically the writer's like, let me convince you that this is my guy. Let's hang out at the house and we'll do it. Well, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm not really a driver in L.A. I, I, you know, uh, this looks a little tight. Like, what if my what if my flight's a little late? I'm going to show up at the airport early and take an earlier flight. Okay, cool. I get on the flight, and I'm in the thing. Uh, it just, the plane just sits there. Just sits there. You know, <laughs> mechanical problem. Hours go by. I look. The flight that I was supposed to be on, I watch leave oh, no. and fly away. Oh, no. And I said oh. to my team, I said, guys, look. You know, I, I, I don't know what to say. Just whatever you do. Make sure Favreau knows that I didn't miss my flight, that I tried to get an earlier flight, and it was delayed. And so, you know, it was going to be so delayed, Favreau's just like, just tell him to come to the callback tomorrow. Just go to the screen test the next day. So, like, don't worry, you're not going to Favreau's house today. And I knew I lost it at that point. But it gets worse, because as soon as Favreau comes in and sees me, what's the first thing he says? What, you fucking miss your flight? <laughs> oh, jeez. And I'm like, no. You, you got hammered by every other actor's <laughs> reputation. <laughs> oh, anyway, so those are like the, uh, two of the biggest heartbreaks. And then not getting Don Draper and finding out years later that I was the director's choice. That was it. Uh, wow. That's, oh, my God. That, oh, Jesus wow. Christ. I, I did go into a depression after losing that role and then uh, sort of felt better when I found out years later by the director's ex-wife on a set. She was my makeup artist. Like, God, you look familiar. Oh my God. I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah, hours go by and somehow Mad Men comes up and she goes, that's it. You auditioned for Don Draper, didn't you? She goes, yeah. I go, yeah. Go, my husband directed that pilot. He was really fighting for you. He really wanted you. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, yeah, you're a director's <laughs> choice. John Hamm <laughs> continues to be your bane to this day. No, well, I, I, I go, You start to I, imagine I the private like jets five, and all the other things that be parked yeah, in your well, backyard. I, I had like four callbacks. John had like six. He goes, no, no. John had John Hamm had 16 callbacks. Wow. You know, they, he, they couldn't, he couldn't convince wow. the network. Uh, Matt Weiner couldn't convince the network that, that, that uh, John Hamm was the guy. Um, because I don't think he was, you know, all that. I don't know. You know, who, who knows why? The, the network, you know, to take nothing away from John Hamm or me, the network wanted a star anyway. You know what I mean? So it was an uphill battle all around. But anyway, finding that out was just like, okay, cool. Well, you know, cool. I was director's choice for that. Good. 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 All right. So, Matt, now that you, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago that like, like, a, like great athletes, there is a time where you kind of, let's say, age out of the age out of being on the field, so to speak. And you go to the front office. So I know, I know for a fact that obviously you have started to move a little bit behind the camera, doing a lot, doing doing producing work. So how has that transition been for you? And obviously you you know started when you first started this interview with us is that your desire has always been, in some senses, to be the guy behind the camera who builds the world. Yeah. So is this is this really now kind of coming full circle for you that I've done the work in front of the in front of the camera I've seen kind of how the sausage is made and now I want to do more the, you know I the the old saying in golf is you know you you drive for show but you putt for dough is this right. now the putting for dough part well no I mean there's no dough in the kind of producing I do when you say you're a producer of films or television or, or anything in show business there's like a thousand definitions of producer right and I probably you know dip my toe in every single one of those definitions over the course of the last few years, basically when influencers started taking all the advertising money and all that voiceover and commercial work that I spoke about earlier that was keeping these families afloat, all of that went away and went into now the pockets of these kids on Instagram. I tried to figure out what the hell to do. And so I sort of, I ketoed that trend. I went to my rich friends, my friends who had like big businesses. And I said, Hey, you know, I've been making television and movies for a long time. Why don't I make your corporate content? 
uh, we'll have fun together. We're friends. You could use uh, some rock and roll, you know, YouTube videos. And a few of those relationships really panned out and they ended up uh, introducing me to a whole different uh, crowd of people who are all sort of dipping their toe in the media market as well. And, you know, so I can function as a consultant or, you know, an expert in some way, you know, just in storytelling. And uh, from that corporate work, I got sort of uh, headhunted into a a production company called Take Two Collective. They do a lot of gigantic events for, we're doing one for the World Cup. We're doing one for the new Cirque show in the Middle East, Cirque du Soleil. We're doing, uh, you know, these massive sort of East meets West TED Talk style things. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, TV and movies. And so I'm sort of their narrative guy. I've got all these films and scripts from my friends and the stuff I've written and the stuff I've thought about that I've always wanted to make. So I'm trying to get these things made. While And how I'm doing that is I'm using um, this, this wunderkind, like, super kid, di- director, filmmaker guy who's much younger than me, uh, who's really able to make these sort of modern artistic, like, run-and-gun films. And I'm learning all the aspects of making these movies and producing these movies with him so that I can then build on that side of the career and make bigger and bigger and bigger movies with bigger and bigger, bigger budgets. And in terms of what I do in that system is really irrelevant. You know, it's being just part of making these living, breathing paintings, you know, that last forever because, you know, yes, every, every video an influencer made will, always be somewhere on the internet one imagines right which is mind-boggling to think of right but you know movies are will will always hang in some kind of gallery you know there'll always be a collection of this work somewhere and that's just a really cool thing to to be a part of and it's very satisfying as the world seems to be burning up and falling apart in every direction Making art right now is is uh, is about as, as as gratifying as it's as I can imagine it's ever been, and there's no shortage of art. To well, make. with that, what what are some of the things that you're working on right now that uh, you'd like people oh, to know about? Thanks for asking. So, uh, my first movie as executive producer came out last year. We had a really good showing at festivals because we well, not it was a great movie, I think, but also. Um, we, it was in the middle of COVID and a lot of productions had to stop. Ours had just finished shooting. So we were able to get it into the markets at a time when the market was starved for it. It's called Pretenders. Uh, it's best described as an LGBTQ stoner comedy, which I don't think there are many of, if any. <laughs> so it holds that distinction. I, I was trying to think of uh, one and I was it's, failing. It's distributed by Gravitas <laughs> Ventures, which means it's on Tubi and it's on Amazon Prime and it's on Apple uh, iTunes. You can get it anywhere you get your streaming movies. It's really cool. It's, uh, it's, it's a wild ride and it's definitely one of those movies that by the end you're like, oh, I... I totally understand where we, what the beginning was about now, because, you know, it, it, there's a pay, let me put it this way. There's a good, there's a great payoff to it. And I just finished very, very associate cool. producing or co-producing there again. I don't really even know what my name will, will be in the credits. Uh, a film called Matt. I'm yeah, sure Matt it will be that. Matt. A film called Herd. <laughs> Herd is a, uh, is a, uh, well, here's the best way I can. This was the pitch for Herd. This is what made me want to uh, make this movie. Uh, a lesbian couple goes to the Ozarks to work on their failing marriage, only to find themselves ensnared in a turf war between dueling white nationalist militia groups and a zombie outbreak. <laughs> oh, Obviously, wow. it's a family flick. Very uplifting. It's a family flick. It's good for a whole family. Yes. Yeah, so. Starring yeah, Marty Bird so and... Got Jeremy Holman <laughs> yeah. in it and Ellen Adair and uh, Corbin Burnson is in it and he's he's guys. Yeah, Wow. It was fun to work with. And I play a character called Tired Governor. So I'm basically the Andrew Cuomo of this zombie outbreak, you know, sort of narrating through, uh, you know, uh, through as, as sort of to keep the audience. Because very, um, it's very intimate. It's not like Walking Dead where you're out in the world. You're in this one location where and this, all this is happening outside, right? Um, so they're, they're only sort of keeping track with what's going on on TV. So that should be really cool. Um, and then what's next? Oh, I'm shooting a horror movie in October up in Connecticut, uh, near Lover's Leap. It's, uh, and it's based on the legend of Lover's Leap, which I guess is an old Native American thing where maybe it was a, a pilgrim and, a, and an Indian. They 
pledged their love for each other and jumped off this cliff and like lovers go and do this all the time now they commit suicide off lovers leap um very, rom- very like romantic idea. yeah right 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 so i'm the lead in that movie <laughs> yeah. it's my first uh lead in a film in a long time so i'm really excited about that wow every scene what's the the target release date so that'll that? be out uh not this not halloween 22 but halloween 23 which will be here before you know it, fellas, Excellent. because Halloween 22 is just around the corner. I hope you have just your costumes ready. Well, you know, it's, it's following the pandemic, I have a completely different interpretation oh, of I time. I feel like we were in a time warp for like three years, and now I don't know what anything means anymore. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, you know... It, Hearing these stories is so inspirational um, and just so fascinating. Also hearing about New York during that era, back in the 90s into the 2000s, the chaos that was going on and the fun that was going on at that time. This that's has my, just been that's my super, super project, cool. By the way, is I want to do a series. Ooh, I'm sitting on a thing. I want to do a series uh, about that time from the perspective of the male lounge owners. Very anti-woke. It's like the male version of Sex in the City meets Entourage. Like That would be Giuliani's New York, and he would be a character in it from the 90s. It would go all the way up until... Uh, September 10th, 2001. So everybody that's listening, you have to sign an NDA because you just heard that pitch. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. There's no way I would miss that because I live it. I I would watch that right now. (laughs) I know. Awesome, guys. Well, hey, thanks so much for having me. It was fun. It's always actors love talking about themselves more than anything. So uh, I, I appreciate you letting me jaw on about all that stuff. And again, like, you know, circle it back around one last time. It was... Failure, not an option. Not in an obsessive way, but just in a get up and do it again. You get hit, you get knocked down, you get up and do it again because eventually people will will respect the the what's the what's the Stephen Still song? It's no it's no matter, no distance. It's the ride, and people will respect. They, they they'll look back in the rearview mirror and say, "Yeah, that guy has been along for the ride this whole time." Let, let let's bring it to him. You know what I mean? And also have the perspective to be present for and enjoy the ride because it's it's way more fun than you realize. And it's over uh, real quick uh, when it's happening. Yeah, dude, that's yep. for damn sure. It flies by. So, kids, smell the roses. What an incredibly interesting conversation. And I, I should say thank you to Matt for the way he ended by coming up with the title for this episode, Failure Not an Option. What an interesting, interesting guy. Uh like I said, Matt is one of the most interesting people I've known for a long time. And I I love look, I, I've known Matt for a long time and I, I didn't know half those stories. I didn't know half of those stories of him growing up, of him, you know, having to break in. I, I actually knew none of the stories about him breaking into the business, which I was very, very happy to hear. And look, <laughs> it makes me it makes me appreciate my friend's journey even more. Uh and that, you know, he really did put in the hard work and you know, I, I joke with him every once in a while that, you know, you're, you're just another pretty face out there. You know, it must be it must be nice to be you being another pretty face out there. You know, well, that's what people say to you. No, it? that's not what they say to me. Normally <laughs> they run the other way like you wouldn't believe. My God, I thought you got bored of that by now. You wanted something different. Oh, my God. But look, I mean, you know, Matt has Matt has done the work. And I, I think that's the one thing you hear from a lot of the interviews we have is that the people we speak to put in the work and their work is rewarded in the end is that if you put in that hard work and you under and, and it's not even a matter of playing the game sometime, sometimes it's just showing people that you want to put the effort in, then you know what, you're going to make it and you're going to and you're going to be able to accomplish maybe not to the maybe not to the heights of what you look, not everyone's going to be Brad Pitt, it's not going to happen. But you know what, you'll be able to make it to a point where you're going to say, I did it and you'll be proud of the effort that you put in. Not only that, Brad Pitt is old, so there's got to be a new Brad Pitt. You know, just you got to you got to try. You got to try to get there. You know, Um, yeah, I love we we keep hitting the same themes on this show, which is super important to just keep hammering home, which is, yes, hard work. Yes, perseverance, determination. Um, You need a couple lucky breaks along the way and you're going to make mistakes, you know, especially in a business like the acting world, because you're relying on a lot of other people to give you those breaks, to make those decisions for you. And sometimes you could be the greatest actor in the world and go to an audition. And guess what? You don't fill what the character needs for that role and you're not going to get it. It doesn't mean you did a bad job. 
So it's really theater of rejection. That's what I what I'm talking about when I say that is you could be the best actor and still not get the gig because that's just the way that the whole game is wired, you know. And sometimes you don't have any acting chops. You haven't worked on yourself at all. You, you never taken a class and you're perfect for the role and you get a break and then you learn as you go. There's a lot of different avenues when you're talking about art, when you're talking about acting and theater. And Matt is super impressive to listen to because that one thread that just goes through everything is he was not going to fail. And when you have that kind of determination, you really can conquer the world. And it's impressive to, to, to listen to for sure. So the one, uh, the one story I'll always, uh, the one quick story I'll have is that Comic-Con, I want to say like seven years ago, this is right after the Avengers movie came out seven, eight years ago, the Avengers movie came out in I guess 2010. So I guess like, you know, maybe more than that, I guess. Um, I got to meet Chris Evans, and I got to meet Chris Evans because of him. So I got to meet Captain America because of my good friend Matt Walton. Oh, so wow. thank you, Matt Walton. Very, very exciting. <laughs> um, you know, my primary takeaway, I mean, it was incredibly uh, inspiring, the perseverance and everything else, but um, I look forward to seeing where he goes with the the idea for a story about the 1990s in New York City and, and what that scene was like in the early 90s of trying to break in, uh, taking the, the the jobs to to try to piece things together to to just kind of keep things going and and also the the limitless possibilities that were present at that time. It really was like the Wild West here in New York then, and and that's when I first got to New York. Um, so it really would be very interesting to see how he would present that, because having lived it, it really was an incredible, incredible time. And a, yeah, a different time where you had to check your answering machine at home, right? And you didn't have a cell yep. phone and you weren't accessible 24-7 like, like we are today. So it is a different path. And, you know, I, I do think that if you're trying to do the same thing today, a lot of these problems have been worked out. You don't have to check with your answering service. You don't have to... You know, you can go to an audition in the middle of the day because you got a call and they got you, right? You don't have to, like, set it up yep. for tomorrow and things like that. Those are advantages. Take advantage of them, you know? Um, it's a beautiful thing. It was a different time for sure. But you can apply so much of what he talked about in this interview to today's game of making it through in the acting world. It was definitely a different time, which leads to us saying thank you to Matt Walton for his time. Be sure to check out his projects, Pretenders, where you get your streaming movies, Heard, and Lover's Leap to be released in 2023. We also thank you for joining this episode of No Wrong Choices. We post about once a week, so please follow us here and visit our website at www.nowrongchoices.com. Com. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at the Fellas NWC or Facebook at No Wrong Choices. On behalf of Tushar Saxena and Larry Shea, I'm Larry Samuels, and we are the Fellas.